I see this attitude is still pervasive and persists. All of you being so ungrateful, so ungrateful to our tribal chief and all that he means and all that he does for you, 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 all of you, every week on SmackDown. That's where y'all taking your cues from Jey Uso. Bunch of ungrateful asses. Ungrateful! Yet another week that our tribal chief sits at the head of the table and carries this show. Big surprise, right? I know, I know. So let's talk about SmackDown for this first week of December 2020. Oh boy. And we got right into it. Like right into it. Ain't no reason to sit there and play around. Let's get right to the heart of the matter. What everybody cares about. We want to hear from the Tribal Chief, and he graciously has granted the request and is going to give us his thoughts on things. And, of course, here comes Kayla Braxton just asking stupid questions. Like Roman's trying to be generous with this time, and that's how it's rewarded. That's how appreciation is shown, by asking him stupid questions. As I posted on Twitter, she's got one more time, one more time, Ask some stupid questions to our tribal chief. Otherwise, she's going to have a big problem with Summer. That's all I'm going to say. And, of course, here comes Kevin Owens, just like everyone else. Freaking glory hog. Typical white thing to do. Now he sees a man of color getting ahead in the world and getting his shot on top. And he wants to bring in a house down. And he wants his shot at relevancy. Well, to borrow a phrase from somebody... Keep it up, and Roman will make you famous. And then, of course, Kevin Owens, being the fat, tubby coward that he is, has to wait until Roman Reigns leaves the ring before he starts calling him out his name and calling him a bitch. Huh? Excuse me? I. He got your ass. Tell me how it worked out for you later. He'll show you who the bitch is. Fantastic opening segment, though. Like, Roman is just... Magnificent in this role. Uh, magnificent also to me would certainly describe Bianca Belair. Just her aura, her presence, her look, her gimmick. Mwah. The EST. Oh, my goodness. But here's what I don't get. Natalia versus Bailey. This is supposed to be about setting up Bailey and Bianca, right? And you can certainly see that they're doing that. And that's clearly where they're going. And that, that's what they're working towards the past few weeks. And they're kind of slow burning it. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. But here's what I don't understand. Here's what I don't get. And I can't agree with. Why in the hell are we working so hard to protect irrelevant ass Natalia? Why? Bianca last week only beat her via roll up. And this week, this week, the longest reigning women's SmackDown champion in history is tapping out to Natalia? At least if you said, hey, Natalia scored a roll up victory on Bailey because she got distracted by Bianca Belair, I get that. That makes sense. That's something that advances the story and doesn't make Bailey look stupid. This makes Bailey look stupid. If Natalia can make Bailey tap out, why in the hell do I want to see Bailey versus Bianca Belair now? That's stupid! How could the same company that gives you the tribal chief, the head of the table, the king of the island, Roman Reigns, give you this diary and garbage? I'll never understand. Unbelievable. Now, certainly, you could tell. And I'm not surprised to see that there were Pat Patterson tributes throughout the course of the night. And I already gave my thoughts a couple of days ago on this channel um, about the passing of Pat Patterson and the great and very complicated legacy that he leaves behind. It is certainly clear to see and easy to understand uh, the significance and meaning and impact that he had both to the WWE as a company and to many of the individuals as, as well. So... On the one hand, it's like they knew one version of Pat Patterson and maybe they didn't know all of the version of Pat Patterson or, you know, maybe as he got older, he got away from some of the other shenanigans that he was alleged to do over the years. But it is a great yet very complicated legacy. Um, but I certainly understand. I'm not going to give him too much grief about, you know, doing a tribute to this guy. 
um, because he did mean a lot to the company. It was cool to see for this Pat Patterson tribute, a uh, six-man tag match. It was all former Intercontinental Champions, although you didn't have to include one of them, I'm just saying. To see the original IC title in all of its 40-plus-year-old used-up glory, and on top of that, there's still, all these years later, Kay Fabin on the Rio tournament that never happened. It's fantastic. Keep the gimmick alive! But here's what I want to know about the six-man tag. Outside of, what did you guys think of Big E and the Wally theme and him now using the powder and doing the LeBron type of ventures? I thought it was cool for Big E. I'd like to start seeing him incorporate the five count again. Uh, but why does Daniel Bryan have to cheat to win? Hmm. And sure, some of you are going to say hey, it was a perfectly executed roll-up finishing maneuver. It wasn't. It was clear he cheated. He did something. He got some hair products in Sami Zayn's eyes. He grabbed the tights. He did something. It wasn't a clean victory. But here's what I don't understand beyond all of that. As much as I want to defend Sami Zayn here. The larger point I'm getting at is knowing one of the jabronis that you have in this match, why in the hell are you having the Intercontinental Champion get pinned here? Like, what happened to the days of understanding how you could do things but also protect people? I guess that's why they've had such a problem creating interesting, relevant characters over the years. Because they do this type of crap. What really doesn't make sense about it is not only, out of all the people, you're going to have the Intercontinental Champion get pinned in the match. That in and of itself in its own bubble is stupid. But then looking at what happened after the match, where you run off Shinsuke and you run off Sammy, and all of a sudden it's... Fucked off Ziggler in the middle of the ring, and you got all three baby faces. They end up wiping them out and destroying them anyway. Why, oh why, and why in the hell didn't you just have <coughs> Dolph Ziggler eat the pin here too? Hell's wrong with you? Why is he in this match? Even as much as that irritates me, it wasn't as bad as that Sasha and Carmelo kind of like split screen side by side sit down. This was bad. I'd be really surprised if that many people actually thought this was really good or interesting. Like, first thing that jumps out to me is why the hell does Carmelo basically look like she's the same skin tone as Sasha Banks? How does that, how does that even work? How is that possible? Like, is Sasha intentionally lightening herself up with makeup? Or is Carmelo intentionally darkening herself up too much with fake tan and makeup? I don't know. Like, maybe I'm just being crazy here, but it, it seemed like it's so obvious to me. I'm, it's really hard to get behind either one of these ladies because they just come across as so fake. And maybe they're not fake in reality. But, like, with the hair and everything else, they just don't seem genuine, authentic, the real deal. They just come across to me as fake as hell. Both of them, their delivery's really bad. I thought technically Carmella got the best line in out of both of them when she's talking about Sasha doesn't like her because Sasha had to, this was her whole goal and whole dream in life and she had to work her tail off to get there. Carmella just happens into it and puts in now we're near the work and sees all the success. Like that was actually a legitimately good line. But other than that, this is really bad. It's getting to the match at TLC. Yes, yeah, so let's hurry up and get over it because... <sighs> Everything about this so far just really is not working. Uh, Buddy Murphy versus Baron Corbin happened. Uh, what the hell was Dominic wearing? Like, people were making comparisons to The Rock from the late 90s. But The Rock not only was rocking a black turtleneck with the jeans, but he was also rocking the fanny pack. You did see a fanny pack from Dominic. Uh, but that, that pink or whatever hell color you want to call it. Wow. Okay. You do you, dog. Uh, apparently, the four forgotten sons are back, but we're not bringing back Gunner, which is perfectly fine with me, his dumbass. But this whole Murphy and Corbin stuff is kind of really weird. Like, now that Seth's gone, it feels like you really didn't think about out the next phase of what you're going to do with Ray or Dominic or Buddy Murphy, just kind of kind of toiling around. And then this is the 50 50 booking crap. Last week, Buddy Murphy wins because of a bunch of interference. This week, Baron Corbin wins because of some help and interference. Like, the whole roles are just opposite, they're reversed, and they're really weird. And, you know, somebody pointed out on Twitter, like I was asking the whole point of this, and they were saying, you know, as I've talked about before, now that Buddy Murphy's been embraced by Ray and Dominic and the Mysterio family, this would be the perfect time for Aaliyah to dump him. If we want to get into the real world, especially for a 19-year-old young lady, this is exactly the type of crap that they would do. Like, she should totally be turning on Buddy Murphy 
Maybe you're setting up to a match at TLC, like you want to make this interesting, give it a little sizzle. How about you have Aaliyah turn against the Mysterio family? Turn against Buddy Murphy. Let's do that. Because her with Buddy Murphy seems really weird, especially if you're not going to have them turn on the Mysterio family. So why not have Leah potentially be a little bit of a heater for Baron Corbin? That's all I'm saying. Uh, but beyond all of that, like all this other stuff, was just really, it was honestly filler. It wasn't the best. But when you've got multiple segments of Roman Reigns on the show, you don't need much else. Your main event is tag match with Roman and Jay taking on Otis and KO. Now, my thought was one, either Roman was intentionally misled about the start time of this match because KO was trying to screw with him because he knew he wanted no parts of this. Certainly possible, or as a Twitter user or two pointed out, is that in this virtual environment in 2020, Rome was not able to be at home with the kids. He could have been on Zoom or FaceTime with the kids, uh, helping them go to bed. You know, it matches the reality that so many of us face in our real life right now. We're working from home, we're virtual. You got dogs and kids and partners in the background, like all types of stuff you got to navigate through and work through. Like, who's to say that Roman isn't experiencing those same types of challenges, even though uh, he's not in a virtual environment? Even though in the Thunderdome, I guess it kind of sort of technically kind of is a quasi-digital environment. But as a tribal chief, as the patriarch of the family, familial patriarchal responsibilities come first. So while some of you are going to talk about he was leaving Jay to blow into the breeze, like, family got to come first. Like, so many of y'all want to talk about that, but all of a sudden, when Roman Reigns sits there and does that, oh, now it's a problem. And for those of you that are going to chime in, will Roman hit Otis repeatedly with the steel steps? Why is that not a DQ? Number one, if you're the ref, do you want a DQ, number Roman Reigns? Number two, this is just like the NBA. You have one set of rules for the others. And then you have a set of rules for the stars. You let them take an extra step. Or in the case of some like James Harden, LeBron, and others, you let them take an extra two or three. That's just the nature of the beast. That's the name of the game. But also, the referee admittedly knew that Otis had it coming. He absolutely had it coming. Welcome to the Island of Relevancy, Otis. Thank you, Tribal Chief, for that beatdown. And of course, here comes Jey Uso, the glory hog, hard-headed ass. Like Roman's trying to insist, tag me in. This is my show. I'm the head of the table. I finish off the show. But no. Jay wants to dawdle and he wants to drag his feet like a petulant little bratty eight-year-old. And he doesn't want to do what he's told by the guy that knows better. Who's the freaking universal champ? So he's sitting there and playing around taking his sweet-ass time, and all of a sudden it backfires. Big surprise. And it almost cost the team the match. So Roman Reigns at this point, understandably so, from his position and what he's been dealing with for months, with Jay and all this heelish behavior, Roman just had enough. And he had to go in there and show him, damn it, how it's done, and he immediately chokes out KO. And then he wants to make sure Jay understands that it's important to teach Kevin Owens what respecting the family's about. So they hit him with some good, clean, stiff steel chair shots. And then afterwards, Roman dishes out punishment to Jay because this is like the situation where you get the mom stumbles upon her kids getting ready to get into a fight with somebody. So she's going to step in and show her ass and everything else. And that's great. But then when she gets home, she's still going to sit there and whoop her kids' ass because they didn't listen to her, didn't do what the hell they, to that they were told to do. Like... Roman has to let KO and Jay know what's what and know what's up. Like, what is it about Jay that he just doesn't get it? He don't listen. He continues to get rewarded with featured segments, opening segments, main event segments, main event matches, big paydays. And when his tribal chief, the head of the family, sits there and makes one simple demand or request from him, he's always got to sit there and rebel against it. God, like Roman doesn't want to do it, but he has to do it because Jay's an idiot. So now it's official. You got KO challenging Roman for the title in the TLC match at TLC. And KO's going to find out who's the bitch when that match happens. And Jay needs to really sit down and think about things 
and determine whether or not he's actually going to start learning his lessons and incorporating the feedback or continue to be a stubborn-hearted ass.